No? Okay. This is an interview with Steve Johnson. It's January 22nd, 2008. We're in the studio on um, WILL AM FM TV in Urbana, Illinois. I'm Nancy Rotzel, and I'm going to be doing the interview. Okay. Steve, where were you when World War broke out, when, when Pearl Harbor started? Would you tell I me a little bit about that and then Maybe give me something about your early life. Sure. I was living on the south side of Chicago uh, at 7213 South Bennett Avenue, to be exact. And um, I was, uh, let's see, this is 1941, so I was 16 years old. <coughs> and um, the, uh, the news that came about Pearl Harbor uh, was after we got home from church that Sunday. We uh, had been going to a Lutheran church uh, uh, also on the south side of Chicago and uh, um, the, uh, the world kind of stopped uh, at that point when, uh, when those, that news came out because everybody knew what that was going to be, uh, what was going to happen after that. So um, I'll get a little more into that later, but uh, the um, as to my background, uh, right now I'm 82 years old. Uh, I was born in Sweden, a little town called Omel in 1925, and we uh, we made a trip to Omel uh, last uh, year, last summer, and it was described as being the second most beautiful town in the world with populations of less than 100,000. I didn't find out what the first one was, but uh, anyhow, it was, it's about 100 miles from Stockholm. And um, I came to the United States uh, in 1928 with my mother, uh, who was 24 at the time, and my brother, who was two years older, he was five. And I had my third birthday on the boat uh, coming over. Um, my dad came to Chicago where uh, he had come three years earlier and um, he saved enough money to, uh, to get uh, transportation costs for us, the rest of his family to come uh, at that point. And we wound up on the south side of Chicago and um, so my brother and I were both uh, foreign born and uh, uh, after Pearl Harbor, uh, my brother enlisted in the Marines at the age of 19, and he was shipped out to uh, Camp Pendleton in uh, California. Um, and uh, he was assigned to a casual platoon because he had enlisted, and they didn't have, they hadn't confirmed his citizenship uh, status. So they wanted to be sure he wasn't a spy or an agent, a secret agent or whatever. So uh, the folks had to send out to California my dad's original certificate of citizenship for him to be accepted and uh, uh, in, as a Marine. So he wound up in the 4th Marine Division, and he went on to uh, places like Saipan and Tinian and Kwajalein and Eniwetok and finally Iwo Jima. So he went all through the war and came home uh, safely. So my mom and dad were able to put up uh, these window hangers with uh, two boys, two sons in the service. Uh, the, uh, the white ones were, uh, oh, I got them backwards. No, I don't, that's right. The blue ones when we were both uh, uh, in the service and the silver ones were because we were both overseas. So, uh, Let's see, uh, just a brief thing about my background. I, uh, I went to uh, schools on the south side of Chicago. Uh, I, I, I was eight years at Bryn Mawr Elementary School, uh, two years at Hyde Park High School, and two of my fellow students at Hyde Park were uh, Steve Allen 
and Mel Torme. Not that we were buddies, but uh, they were there. And uh, then I went on to two years at uh, South Shore High School, which is on the South Side. It was a brand new school, uh, and I was in that area, so I got transferred from Hyde Park to South Shore. Then I spent a year at Wilson Junior College. Um, on May 6, 1943, I turned 18. And on June 5th, I was classified 1A. And on June 30th, I was inducted into the Army. Pretty fast uh, entry. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, that they took at the uh, Selected Service Center, if I can find it. Yeah, I should have dug it out closer. Yeah. Well, I can't find it real fast, so. Uh, <laughs> Does this happen often? Okay, so I reported for active duty on July 14th, 1943 at uh, Camp Grant in uh, Rockford, Illinois. Um, and after 12 days there, I left <coughs> by train for uh, Fort Ord, California and arrived there on July 31st. And what rank were you? I okay. was uh, definitely a buck private, <laughs> no rank, <laughs> um, 18 years old, um, just the uh, first time I'd been away from home uh, that far in my life. Other than Sweden? Other than Sweden, right, yep. Um, so at Fort Ord, um, we uh, took our basic training there and we were told that it would be about 12 weeks, and it turned out to be more than that, and we found out later that the reason was uh, that one of the, uh, the troop transports that was going to take us overseas uh, uh, was sunk by the, uh, by the Germans. So um, we, uh, we didn't uh, actually leave uh, the States until January 5th, uh, 1915. 44. Um, as far as the uh, at Fort Ord, we had the usual basic training of um, uh, we did a lot of uh, calisthenics, a lot of uh, training on various uh, munitions, and uh, uh, we we did bivouacs, we did uh, that sort of thing. Um, not too much uh, unusual there. But on, on, uh, on the 5th of January, uh, we boarded a, uh, uh, a Dutch liner called the uh, New Amsterdam, N-I-E-U, it was uh, spelled. And we had um, about 10,000 troops on that ship um, that, that normally held uh, like 2,000 uh, cruise ship uh, customers, and we um, we were uh, we were uh, quartered in the uh, theater of the ship, uh, seven bunks high. So you can imagine uh, the, uh, the the close quarters that we had. We only got two meals a day because. Uh, as soon as they finished uh, one meal, they were ready to start the second one with uh, 10,000 troops on board. Um, I wondered whether I would get seasick because I hadn't uh, been on that kind of a boat before. And when we left uh, San Francisco Harbor and saw the Golden Gate uh, diminishing in the, in the rear view mirror, so to speak, um, the, uh, the ship started uh, swelling and uh, uh, but I, I survived that and I did not get sick a lot of a lot of the guys did and uh, that was uh, <laughs> uh, unpleasant but um, we finally all made it to um, uh, we arrived in Auckland New Zealand and spent 
one, one day and one night there. We never got off the ship, except I was reading a letter from one of my buddies where he said we, we all got off and were given an ice cream bar. I don't even remember that, but um, anyway, the stop in New Zealand was very brief. And it took, uh, let's see, about 19 days for the entire trip from uh, Frisco to uh, um, New Zealand. And um, we, we were all under blackout orders, no lights on the ship at night. And uh, uh, we passed the time by playing cards. And uh, uh, they had, um, oh, they had things like boxing matches and uh, uh, not not much uh, else, but uh, uh, that sort of thing. So then from Auckland, we went to Sydney, Australia. And uh, uh, we were there in uh, Australia for about, uh, th about three weeks, uh, sort of an R&R &R situation before we went up into the islands. And I don't remember much about Australia except uh, uh, the, uh, we were in Sydney, and there was uh, there was a uh, an entertainment spot like a carnival or something mm -hmm. of that sort that we visited, and uh, there were girls, and uh, we uh, the girls were young and attracted to the troops, and they had the accent. Uh, they were only eighteen, uh, so uh, so we enjoyed the trip, uh, the stay in Sydney. And then on February 10th of 1944, we, um, we, we got aboard a, the uh, USS Etamin, E-T-A-M-I-N, and wound up in, uh, on the southern tip of uh, New Guinea, uh, a town called Milne Bay. Yeah. How did, where along the, the line did they decide what your job was going to be? What you were, were you tested? Were you, uh, how did they do that? Well, we were told that, uh, when we were at Camp Grant, uh, um, before we went to uh, California, that we were told that they had selected those with the highest uh, testing, uh, what do they call it, not the IQ, but uh, that equivalent, and that uh, the, those were the boys that were being assigned to this outfit. So um, there weren't any. Now, I came into the uh, outfit. Uh, my my unit was the uh, 3rd Engineer Special Brigade, uh, the 543rd Engineer Boat and Shore Regiment, uh, C Company, 2nd Boat Platoon. And all of, most of these fellows <clears throat> had been down to Florida, boat training down there, and then also in camp, um, a camp in Massachusetts. Uh, I forget the name of it. But so they had had a, a great deal of the boat training that I missed uh, because I came in on, on the late end. Um, but uh, periodically there would be promotions from private to PFC, and I don't know it took me a while to get the first stripe, and then later on I got the second stripe with a T, technician fourth fifth grade. Uh, that made me uh, qualified to be an engineman on the boat which uh, uh, I might say a little bit about the boat. The, the, I was on a landing craft, uh, 50 foot long, uh, ramp loading. Uh, it was 14 feet wide, and um, it was propelled by uh, two screws, tw uh, propellers, two, uh, they call them screws, and, r and rudders. And... Um, Let's see what else about the boat. Uh, the boat. The boats were shipped to Milne Bay, New Guinea, where I was just saying we had arrived, and that was the point of assembly. They they shipped the boats in units of about I think there were 12, 12 units to uh, the full boat. Uh, there were three three bulkheads on one side, three on the other, and then three on the on the uh, well of the boat. And then, of course, the stern and the ramp, and they, these were all shipped uh, broken down because these were <laughs> 50 foot long. And then they were they were uh, assembled in in Milne Bay and became a boat factory in a, in effect. 
<laughs> and uh, the um, then the as they were completed, the the uh, the guys were assigned uh, four to a boat. There was a coxswain, an engineman, and uh, two seamen. So um, and they, they at at one point they got up to I think where they were putting out like 150 of these boats uh, per month for several months until they reached the point where they had an, what the, the amount that they needed. And then um, the, the men who had been in Carabelle, Florida, and in uh, Massachusetts, those were the veterans and they were, they were the uh, first ones to get the, uh, the higher grade uh, um, uh, stripes and, and th they would be T4s, technician fourth grade, and uh, the T was uh, to indicate that they didn't have line authority. They were, they were, they were not uh, commandeering, or uh, supervising, or ordering around uh, the other the other troops. So, um, so then, uh, when we first arrived in in New Guinea, um, we uh, we were in the jungles. Uh, there was nothing there. So we, we slept on cots uh, for uh, a while with mosquito bars, mosquito nets over us because they were vicious uh, in that area. And then as, the, as they unloaded the, uh, the boats in the packing crates, they used that lumber to, um, to build the floors, to build a deck for the tents that they put up uh, eventually. And it, it took a while. And uh, even farther down the down the road, they uh, they were able to generate electricity, and mm -hmm. so we had lights. At first, we had candles and flashlights, and uh, so the nights were uh, kind of uh, long. But uh, but we had worked we worked hard all day, and uh, uh, we slept pretty pretty good. So. Did you have any idea where you were going? Uh, nope, we had no idea. No, not even when we were in Australia. So we when we were on the boat heading there they, they finally uh, told us but uh, and then they 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 told us uh, pretty much what we would be doing and what we were doing in New Guinea was uh, sh uh, transporting supplies and troops to uh, cities and towns farther up the uh, the peninsula or the island in uh, New Guinea and uh, uh, anything from Vehicles, or it would be jeeps, uh, small trucks, uh, uh, troops, uh, supplies, food, munitions, all kinds of things. We were kind of a traveling trucker uh, uh, in that in that situation. And then we would. Um, there were towns along the way like uh, Oro Oro Bay, O R O, which means gold in Spanish. And uh, in my journal, I kept a logbook during the uh, time we were overseas. And uh, I, in the logbook, I, I spelled it O-R-A-L because I thought, I thought that's what they were saying. And some, one of my buddies pointed out uh, some years later, hey, that should be O-R-O. -O. Okay. And then there was uh, Finchhaven, Gasmata. There were some towns nobody ever heard of. <clears throat> and we would go from one end of the island uh, to the other uh, and back. Uh, picking up more stuff and bringing it on up the uh, up the island. Some of the other places that were mentioned: uh, Cape Ferguson, uh, Kiwak, Itapi, Hollandia, Wack D, Angau, Lindenhaven. So there was uh, a lot of, uh, as I say, places nobody ever heard of. Uh, then we went from there to. Um, uh, New Britain Island, which was close, and uh, did the same thing. We, uh, as we were getting closer to the action, the um, <coughs> we would move along, and then we went to places like Maui Harbor, uh, Sac Sac River, Ablingi Island, Awab Point, uh, Bertha Channel, Ring Ring, Seawat, Wallangau, Palelo, and and Ajut, uh, all kinds of uh, strange. Towns where we delivered our uh, our, our stuff. Um, during one of those trips, uh, I contracted uh, malaria, and um, we were um, 
I started shivering and shaking, and I, uh, we, we, we were taking, uh, they, they did not have quinine, which was the main uh, antidote for uh, malaria in, the, in, uh, in those days. Uh, they had something called adabrine, which was a yellow pill, and you took, uh, I don't know whether it was one with every meal or one a day, but it was pretty regular. And it actually made you look yellow uh, after you took it for a long time. But in my case, it, it didn't help uh, prevent it. So, so I was in the hospital at uh, Oro Bay for uh, recuperating for about seven or eight weeks. They uh, dropped me off on the way down. And then the next time they came that way, they picked me up again. So, so I was out of commission there for uh, a period of time. And then we went on to uh, places like Weewak, Itapi. I mentioned some of those. Um, later in that year, 44, we went to an island called Biak in the Schouten Islands, S-C-H-O-U-T-E-N. Yeah, they called it the, the Netherlands East Indies or the Dutch East Indies. And uh, it was during this period that we got our second LCM, uh, landing craft, the boat. The boat. And um, uh, this one was 56 foot long. The original one was 50. And um, we had uh, titled uh, our first boat Lucky Lady. So this was Lucky Lady uh, number two, Roman numeral two. Um, so the the first one lasted uh, 240 days, approximately eight months, and it ran about 820 hours. Um, I kept track in my logbook of the um, of the hours that we ran each day, and the uh, the amount of fuel used. We had. Um, we had two 450-gallon tanks on the boat, and by the way, we were we, we had two um, uh, gray marine twin diesel engines. There was strictly diesel in the uh, in the uh, landing craft uh, because of the safety factor, and um, uh, let's see where was I going with that? <laughs> were you were you Protected during all that time, or did, did were you ever uh, under attack, or were you during that, was that period, a safe no, place that, to that, be? We were th those places were all relatively safe. Yeah, we hadn't, um, we we were not under attack at any point during that those uh, that first year. Or so there was always a threat, uh, but uh, but actually uh, no. Then um, on February second, nineteen forty-five. Our boat was loaded aboard a uh, personnel attack carrier, the U.S. Biddle, B-I-D-D-L-E, and we were lashed to the deck <coughs> with three other boats of our, uh, three other LCMs. And we went um, to, from Biak uh, to uh, uh, Lady in the Philippine Islands, which was the scene of a, a huge, uh, uh, naval battle and lots of action there before we got uh, before we got there. Um, then we we left Lady and went uh, to an island called uh, Mindoro, and um, we um, I have a note here that we hired a Filipino boy at one point there that we were to do odd jobs which. Uh, Apparently, uh, all the boat companies did it. You know, they they had them wash the decks and <laughs> do whatever odd jobs we didn't want to do, and we paid them 30 pesos a month, and uh, they were there for a couple of months, something like that. But then, in uh, March of '45, we loaded aboard a 32-ton uh, Sherman medium tank and a five-man crew, and we drove aboard an LSD a landing ship dock, which is a boat that goes down in the water and you drive your boat into it. And um, we that's for longer, where we're going on a, a long distance. 
uh, and there were 14 other LCMs on this uh, dock, this LSD, so you can imagine the size of it. Um, and uh, we were heading for a town called Zamboanga. This was our first combat. Uh, it was J-Day. And the, um, this was on the, um, the, um, the southernmost island of, of the Philippines, uh, Mindanao. And um, this, they, they, um, during, the, during the war, they had a song uh, about Zamboanga. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, but it was called, The Monkeys Have No Tails in Zamboanga. Oh, the monkeys have no tails in Zamboanga. So that was a fun song. But um, on that day, March 10th, 45, we, um, this is, it's kind of like you see in the movies where uh, the, there were the, 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 uh, the ocean was full of our craft. Uh, there were a lot of LCMs, a lot of destroyers, cruisers, uh, every kind of a ship you could. We didn't have any battleships there, but or the heavy cruisers, but we had light cruisers all the way down. And uh, the Air Force came in first. It was a beautiful sunny day, I remember. The palm trees were waving in the breeze. Um, and the Air Force came in first and dropped their loads, uh, one after the other. Uh, and. Uh, as I put in my logbook, the uh, the shoreline was a mass of smoke and flame, uh, and then then the uh, the naval bombardment started. The destroyers and the cruisers were cut cut loose uh, with their uh, all of their stuff, and then finally the um, the uh, some of the smaller ships w went right up to the shore with uh, rockets and. and <laughs> And, and the whole play, I mean, we had a young lieutenant on our boat who said, uh, ho, ho, unopposed landing. And we all could have killed him because we, we know that uh, we, had, we know that uh, they dig in and they, they, uh, they're in caves and underground and all of that. So uh, we were not happy with uh, that comment. But anyway, we hit the beach about 9.15 a.m. Uh, the boat went into shore. Uh, the coxswain, uh, a guy named Hollis P. Loudermilk, he was from Cornelia, Georgia, dropped the ramp, the tank, uh, and it was, uh, he did a great job of getting it far enough on the beach so the tank could go uh, uh, on the beach and, and uh, not sink down in the water. And off they went, and then we reversed engines and backed out and went out to uh, way out through three, four miles from shore to uh, our rendezvous point. And, um, and then um, we, were, we were told that uh, later that, that uh, 2,900 Japs had died in that operation and about 130 of our guys. Um, uh, during that uh, time, uh, we were, um, let's see, we, the landing was on the 10th. On the 14th, all of the men were called off the boats, except one to stay with the boat, uh, because we had uh, heard that there was going to be a counterattack by the Japs, and they wanted every, every uh, man possible to be, uh, to be there for that, to support the, the ground troops. <coughs> and. Um, I was uh, assigned, well, not assigned, but I, I wound up in a, uh, a shell hole from the bombardment. And uh, one of my buddies was uh, a few feet away and they were spread all over the place. And uh, we went in there at dusk. Um, and uh, it was um, a long night, one of the longest nights of my life. and. Um, the, um, you imagined all kinds of things. You could see the palm trees waving in the breeze, and uh, uh, you wondered, uh, you know, is that is that somebody or whatever? And of course, we were told, don't shoot unless you're sure. So, um, 
and we had our helmets on, and along about four, five, six hours later, you begin to nod, and um, and then when when your neck drops and with the helmet on it, oh, that's a jolt. So, so, uh, but as it turned out, there was no counterattack, and we uh, we uh, uh, we were never so glad to see uh, the sun come up as, as on that date. But I did forget one other incident uh, earlier on uh, going back to New Guinea for a minute. Uh, we had uh, we got caught in a um, in a hurricane uh, going up the coast of New New Guinea, and uh, the uh, the conditions were such that we we weren't at a point where we could get into a bay or a harbor, so we had to ride it out, and there was a convoy of about fourteen landing craft like ours, and. Uh, the um, and it was at night. It started the the water started getting rough uh, towards uh, dusk, and um, we um, we we were just simply caught and 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 had to ride it out. But uh, I I got up on deck and looked, uh, and if you've ever seen a wave that's about twenty thirty feet high coming at you. And then your your going your boat is going down into the trough, and when it hits the trough, bang! It hits the bottom of the trough, and then it starts going up again, and your the wave is going over, and and uh, uh, it's it's a very terrifying thing to to look at, uh, and that was um, maybe the second longest night of my life because that storm didn't abate until. Uh, uh, Mid morning, so even even in in the daylight, it was still uh, pretty strong. But the the, um, the the coxswain had to be he was the he was the the real guy uh, who was who was uh, in charge, and he was guiding the boat. And there was a um, the command boat had a searchlight, a search beam, and he would periodically uh, uh, indicate that we should get closer because uh, they didn't want any boats drifting off to where we, we wouldn't be able to find them. So, um, and we had, uh, I think there were five or six on the on the boat at that time, and we were all down in the well area. And the um, uh, we couldn't do anything but talk or, and I was, I was so tired because we had worked hard that day that I was lucky enough to fall asleep for a while so uh, I was kind of out of it, <laughs> and there was a young, an older guy from uh, Sh Chicago. He was 36 years old. That's an older guy in, in the service, and uh, he was just boy, I don't know. And uh, the, uh, when we got back to the to safety, uh, he said he he had to get out of this outfit. He he would never make a sailor. So <laughs> so um, let's see. There was. Um, Oh yeah, something else I meant to mention was the fact that we we lived on those boats, uh, and we had to build our own facilities. We had to we had to build a cabin. When we first started out, uh, we had cots in the well of the boat, and we would throw a canvas over us or a raincoat if uh, if the, if it started raining. But then. Um, as the time went by, we got some lumber from again from these uh, packing cases that were uh, bringing our uh, boat parts overseas, and we would build a, a floor or a deck, and it wasn't very long. It was about six, seven feet out out over the well deck, and then it was a, a flat uh, flooring, and then there were three two cots, an upper and a lower on each side of that platform and then we built a, um, a roof over that with um, uh, uh, a canvas covering and we had of course a uh, an opening where we could go inside and uh, if it was raining heavily which it frequently did there was a, we were there during the rainy season uh, and um, so we were able to get a lot more comfortable by uh, being uh, in in uh, in the cabin and of course, 
as I think I mentioned, the uh, the temperature there was always uh, very um, season, very, you know, 80 degrees, 90 degrees. It was uh, very warm weather, so uh, uh, being cold was never never a factor. Did you did you cook there yourselves, or did you have cave rations? Well, or? we um, initially we we had strictly uh, the the uh, the C rations, K rations. They had something called ten and one rations, uh, where they were little, um, oh, little crackers and cans of uh, uh, beef stew. That sort of. I hate. I got to hate beef stew. Um, but uh, we and uh, later on we got a little Coleman stove uh, where you could uh, pump uh, and uh, heat heat things up. But uh, for the most part, we uh, we did no cooking uh, on board, but but periodically we uh, we went to shore when we were going to be for a, a more or less an extended period. We and then we were in tents, uh, so we were able to they were able to set up a, a kitchen and uh, serve uh, more normal food uh, from time to time. So. Um, well, let's see. I got a letter from my brother on March of '45, and he was safe after the Iwo Jima invasion. Um, on March, on April 12th, '45, we got news that President Roosevelt had died, and that Harry Truman took over. And I put a note in my journal that uh, I was 19 years old, and I said, uh, "I guess FDR will probably go down as one of our uh, greatest presidents." And um, let's see, on May 8th, we got news that Germany had surrendered, and that was a big day. Uh, uh, May 9th was VE Day, victory in Europe. Uh, How did you find out all those things? Well, the, in the early part of our tour over there, we, uh, we, we didn't know anything. We, we, for weeks at a time, we wouldn't hear anything. And then. Uh, as we stopped in these various towns and places, then we would get word that we finally got uh, a little radio, and that was the greatest thing uh, that we we could have gotten. So we could uh, we could hear news reports and that sort of thing. So yeah. Um, let's see, where did we go from there? Oh yeah, then on June fifteenth of forty-five. I got in an airplane for the first time in my life, uh, a C-47, with 20 other men, and we went to uh, a, town, a place called Moritai in the Malacca Islands to work with uh, Australia's, uh, uh, a group of Australians, that, that was their famous Ninth Division. They were well known for uh, uh, victories and uh, uh, good work overseas there. And they were preparing for the invasion of Borneo, which was Japanese held at that time. And when we arrived there, we, we did finally get uh, a, uh, an attack of the Japanese Zeros. Um, they bombed the airport, uh, and, uh, but it was a one-shot thing. And uh, um, that, re that reminds me, too, when we were in uh, Zamboanga, there was an airplane, a Zero, that flew over the dock on that same day that we were talk thinking about the counterattack, and uh, he was he was he was low enough uh, and close enough so I could see him in, in the cockpit going over. Now some of the guys said he was strafing, and I didn't remember. I think that was an embellishment because I think he was a, a reconnaissance plane that was uh, checking out. Uh, the, uh, the, our, the, our situation there. Um, after the Zamboanga landing, we made two other landings on um, on uh, islands around uh, places around there. One called Basilan, and one called Jolo, and they, they were fairly uh, minor. The um, the brochure that we have down here shows that uh, our brigade had sixty combat landings. Now, I was only in three of them, and these others were all in different places by the different brigades. We had, there were four, four engineer special brigades. One of them went to uh, Africa, 
and the other three mostly were in the South Pacific. So, uh, uh, okay, then on um, August 10th of 45, we got a news flash that Japan had surrendered. I do have a letter in this book here that I wrote to the folks uh, about that day. And uh, I'd like to read the first part of it. But um, just to set the picture, we were, um, we were in the, um, we were at a movie out in the, uh, the jungles uh, under the palm trees. We're sitting on logs and uh, the movie was interrupted by uh, the, uh, I guess, the projectionist, and he announced that uh, Japan had surrendered. And uh, did you know about the atomic bomb being dropped? Yes, we had heard that. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, a few days before, a couple of days before, we had the, we had heard that the uh, that the bombs had been dropped. So we knew that. It was something was something big was happening, and um, so they stopped the movie. Uh, he announced that the war was uh, over, and there was nothing said for a, a minute or two. Everybody was uh, shocked, I shell shocked, I guess. And um, but and then he they turned the movie back on, and uh, he shouldn't have because nobody wanted to see the movie anymore. And that was when they came around and collected all the all the arms, the, the rifles, uh, the uh, anything that would uh, would ha had a bullet in it. And then they passed out uh, six cans of 3.2 beer to every every uh, soldier, and um, they were whooping it up. I mean, I tell you. And um, I've got a picture in the in this uh, life book here of the boats in the harbor, Lady Harbor. Uh, did I say Zambar? This was at Lady. And um, they shot off um, pyrotechnics of every kind. I mean, it was, it was just a giant fireworks display. And uh, uh, horns were honking, and uh, it was just a, a heck of an occasion. So, um, would it be possible for me to can you reach that book uh, that I could uh, read part of that letter? Okay. All set? Uh, this was on Sunday, August 12th, 1945. Dear, dear folks, I'm sorry I haven't written for the past two days, but I've been too busy trying to figure out whether the war is over or not. I've had my ear glued to the radio all day today and yesterday, and I only hope now that Japan accepts the United States peace offer. The radio announcer just said that the programs to follow will be interrupted if any late bulletins come in, so they must be expecting the end soon. The night before last, I was sitting at the show when the movie operator cut off the sound and said, the news just came over the radio that the war is over. Nobody could say a thing for about a full minute, and then they cut loose with such cheering and yelling like I never heard before. The operator turned on the movie again, but nobody was interested in that anymore, and the truck took us back to camp. They issued uh, six extra cans of beer to every man and ordered all rifles turned in to the supply room so no one would get hurt. No one would get too excited and start shooting them off. Everybody sat around in the tents drinking beer, singing like nobody's business, and kidding about getting their equipment packed and ready to leave for the States in the morning. That kept on till about 2 uh, a.m., and you never saw such a bunch of happy guys. Out in the harbor, ships were shooting off red flares, automobile horns were blowing, and it seemed like the whole island was yelling and cheering. That's one night I'll never forget. Boy, I'll bet the people back in the States really raised hell when they heard about Japan offering to surrender. Well, it can't be more than another day or so before all fighting and bombing stops. Just think what a wonderful day that will be when no more people are getting killed and the whole world will be at peace again. Um, now, I, the letters that uh, I sent to my folks, they kept, uh, every one of them. And um, 
So over a two and a half year period, that's a lot of letters. And, and they, um, they kept them in the original envelopes uh, and with the stamps and everything else. And, um, and then I inherited that when my folks died, I, I got all those letters. And um, many, many years later, I decided to put them in order. So I put them in uh, uh, chronological order by, by date and took them out of the envelopes. And then just uh, a year or two ago, I converted them to um, the computer. So um, every letter that I, um, that I had written home, I converted uh, to the computer. And then uh, those were I put on software. Two, I got two software um, floppy disks and uh, so they're preserved, and I have one in my safety deposit box, and, uh, and then of course I have the um, uh, the computer uh, in memory. So um, so, and uh, the letters um, are still in amazingly good. Uh, I mean, this is 65 years ago, and the letters are still very readable. They're they're yellowing and aging, but. It's amazing how well preserved they are. So, so I've got both the original letters and the um, the computerized ones. Uh, Thinking back about it, when you read the letters, did you sound like you were eighteen? Yeah, all I the did. way through. Yeah. Or, um, well, I guess I matured a little bit. But when you think about when I was discharged, I was still only twenty years old. I was short of my uh, my twenty first birthday, so I couldn't get a beer in in, uh, uh, in in a bar. I had to, you know, check my. Well, I wasn't a drinker anyway, but <coughs> but I, I was less than twenty one when I got out. Um, so then, uh, while we were at Leyte, uh and these big, the big news came through, we were actually preparing for the invasion of Japan. And uh, what would your role have been there? The same. We would have been uh, uh, delivering troops uh, on the beaches and uh, and supplies. Uh, we um, we um, it was called the, the greatest battle that was never fought, because in the projections that they made about the uh, the number of people that would have died had they had to. Uh, land on the on the Japanese soil, uh, it would have been it would have been just uh, terrible. There are m uh, numbers uh, somewhere. Uh, I think they're in the millions. Uh, so uh, because, but then the two uh, atomic bombs uh, took care of that. And uh, Harry Truman, who was pretty much um, maligned. Uh, as a successor to FDR, he he was a rookie and he didn't know what he could do and all that. But then later on, he became uh, recognized as, as a pretty good president, making big decisions. What rank were you by this point? I was still a T five uh, mm -hmm. at that point, and um, we actually did uh, go to Japan. Uh, uh, on September 18th of 45, we left Lady in a convoy of, um, uh, I don't have the number down there, but it was our whole outfit. And we got a hauled aboard a, uh, an AKA, the U.S. Southampton. And seven days later, we arrived on the northern tip of uh, Honshu in Japan, a town called Amori, A-O-M-O-R-I. They had a population of about 100,000, and they were about 400 miles from Tokyo. Um, and we moved ashore to barracks, at, uh, in, uh, and then we, uh, then we hit the cold weather, which we weren't used to for two years in the balmy South Pacific. And um, there they had stoves, and we had to get uh, uh, cold weather gear, uh, uh, warmer coats and underwear, and the whole bit. And uh, and then we uh, 
we took uh, our lucky lady number two and drove it up to the final resting place. Um, and, and in that month, in the month of October of '45, we were uh, we were all issued a, a souvenir Japanese rifle and bayonet. And uh, you know, I never, I never, I don't know what happened to that thing, but I, I had it for a long time, and I let somebody borrow it, and then somewhere it got lost in in transit, I guess. But oh, here's uh, here's when I was made uh, Tech Four. Uh, November 1st to 45. That was just about two months before I was discharged, so I only got the extra pay for uh, uh, a couple of months. But then, um, that, oh, there, there was one incident in uh, Japan that I got to tell you about. Um, I was assigned as a corporal of the guard one one day to drive the soldiers to their posts in the, in the, in, the, in a jeep, and. Uh, I didn't want to tell them that I couldn't drive. I'd never driven in my life. So, uh, but I had a day or two uh, before I had to do it. So I, um, I was talking to my buddies and uh, how do you, how do you do this anyway? I was just thinking of the letter H. You know, the, the the center thing is neutral and up in the left. And so they told me all about the gears and all that. So um, here we go for the guard duty, and I'm, uh, <laughs> so I, I was. Pretty bad at first, but um, it didn't take me too long to get the hang of it. Somehow I got them there and back. So um, then on December question mark I'm not sure of the date 45 we left Amori by train for the separation center in Yo Yokohama and the um, the they were uh, assigned. Uh, by the point system, you uh, you went home earlier if you had uh, the higher number of points, and it was based on your age, uh, whether you were married, whether you had kids, your length of service, your length, your number of months overseas. All of those were taken into consideration, and I was kind of at the lower point because I was only uh, 19. By that time, I was 20. But uh, no other uh, uh, points that would uh, that would help me along those lines. But anyway, I finally left Amori early December uh, or Yokohama. Uh, that was the uh, the point of embarkation, and then uh, we arrived in um, Vancouver Barracks in Seattle on December nineteenth of forty five. Uh, hoping we would get home for Christmas, but that didn't work out. So uh, we left Seattle for Camp Grant, uh, Rockford, where I started out uh, in the in the very first place, and my discharge was on January second, nineteen forty six. Um, so when I got to uh, when I got my discharge, I, I went to downtown Chicago, bought a train ticket to get home, called my folks and said, uh, I'm here. And my brother was there and he said, uh, I'll come and pick you up. And I said, uh, I've got a train ticket. He said, that's all right, I'll come and get you. So he came in his, what do you have, a 35 Dodge Coupe. And um, uh, he picked me up and, um, uh, I said, wow, I said, I never thought I'd get home again. He says, why? There's a guy who was in Iwo Jima, and uh, so, but um, I still got that train ticket uh, um, in my files, that's, uh, the unused train ticket. Um, let's see, I probably have left out some things, but um, after I was discharged, I was uh, able to take advantage of the GI Bill of Rights and go on to, um, uh, I finished my second year at the uh, community college, Wilson, Wilson Junior College, and then I uh, went on to the University of Chicago and got my MBA degree. Thank you, uh, Uncle Sam. And then, let's see, um, I went to work. Um, my f 
first job was um, as a junior cost accountant on the south side of Chicago at the grand salary of $200 a month with an MBA degree. Um, things were mighty tough in uh, 1949 when I, when I got that first job. So, but then after that, I, I stayed with um, that company for the rest of my life. I was there 30, 39 years and worked my way up to uh, the corporate treasurer's job. And um, then, uh, let's see, that, that's uh, kind of a nutshell history of my life. Uh, I, I got married and had three kids uh, after I was out. And uh, my first wife died of uh, breast cancer in 1989. And I met Myrna in 1992. And uh, we've been married for 16 years uh, now. So. so you started out in Rockford. You came back to Rockford. Yep. If you had to sum up the period of time in between, can you do it in just a sentence or two? Wow. Well, it was uh, two and a half years out of my uh, young life. Uh, I was foreign born, but I fought for my country. Uh, the um, the United States is the greatest country in the world, and uh, my mother always said, "We come to America or fix the brawl." She said, "We came to the uh, America and had it good." So now she was a little uh, leery when uh, when Pearl Harbor happened because uh, she knew that what was going to happen, and her first words were, "Oh, nobody der Krieg." Now there will be war. And she knew that her two sons were going to be uh, involved, and they were. But they came out OK. And uh, now my older brother died uh, at the age of 81 about two years ago. And, uh, but he had a good life, too. And uh, uh, so it was worth it. It was, it was definitely worth it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.